So thank you all for coming. This is this is great, actually. We, you know, we are only been at this now for a, I don't know a month, less than a month. So you know, we're we're always pleased that anybody shows up to like who is that crazy guy. But uh, yeah, it's it's been a fun journey so far. We've. We've started our little project with our, our first tiny farms is what we're calling it. That's really what we're going to talk about today. But really, I want this to be an open discussion. It's, it's just like family. We're going to sit around and talk about why, is it, why this is important and, and how it relates to you. And I'd love your feedback about how we can make it better, how we can, we can begin this process of restoring small farms. I, I, by, by no means do I have, I'm not excluding you over there either. I'm going to come up, I'm going to work with you. So, um, by no means do I have all the answers to these to these perplexing questions, but I think we have a plan that can get things started and take that first step towards restoring our small farm. So for those of you who haven't seen our, our Indiegogo video, I'm going to play it right now. Um, for those of you who have seen it, this is probably a great time. You have five minutes to go to the bathroom or you know, get a drink of water. So um, take it away, Maestro. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do some, some audience participation since, you know, you guys are, need a little bit of oomph after lunch to, uh, to get you woken up. All right? So here's our first question that we're going to answer here. Show of hands. How many believe that the cost of fuel is going to drop in the future? How far is it? Not going to happen. That's a huge problem for our, for our farms. The further we keep moving our farms out, or the, uh, the, our existing farm infrastructure that is out there, away, somewhere else, it, that, that creates a problem for us. That means that, that fuel costs are going to impact our food system, especially, probably more than most places, most cities, because we are almost 100% reliant on food to come from somewhere else. So as fuel prices go up, our food prices are going to go up. That's going to hurt us as a city over time. All right, next audience participation question. How many believe that the price of land will drop in the future? Wow, I had some really challenging questions here, didn't I? Um, same problem. We have to address this. If we don't start building farms now, our city's going to continue to grow. We're going to keep moving out further and further into those areas that are uh, and on the periphery of our city. We're going, to, we're going to make it more palatable for people to move out there. We're going to build more infrastructure into that area. And that means we've pushed our farms eventually further and further and further out into the prairies, into the plains. We're obviously not going to go too far west. You know, we can't farm on a mountaintop. So we're going to have to, uh, we're going to move our, our farms out further. That means it's further for us to drive in. That means there's fewer resources out there, harsher climates things that we have to deal with that we don't want to necessarily have to farm with. All right, and here's the, I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to give you a, a pointer on this one. This is the trick question for the afternoon, okay? How many believe that the corporations that control the industrial food system will absorb those additional costs instead of passing them along to the consumers? <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Yeah, food. Yeah, that's the trick question for the afternoon. It, obviously, the, you know, we're going to see all of those, all of these costs that we're talking about are going to ultimately the, the, the margins right now. And Mike fights this battle and has fought this battle for years. Of the industrial food system is just can, continuing to to uh, coalesce, get larger, bigger corporations, thinner margins. All of those costs have to be pushed along to us as a consumer. So, land costs, food. Uh, uh, the cost of actual doing farming. Um, we talked about we talked about fuel. In, in my opinion, in in the farming industry, all roads lead to the fuel pump. So whether it's whether it's at the beginning when we're we're buying the petrochemicals that we need to make the fertilizers for the fuel for the equipment, the fuel to transport, the fuel to keep it cold, keep it in the stores, to keep the lights on in the stores. All of those costs are going to to add to the overall cost of our food. So how do we fix that? How do we get farms in close, restore those small farms? We shorten that fuel cycle. We shorten that, the, the, the time that we need to preserve these, the foods that we're producing. And we, that allows us to ultimately feed ourselves, feed ourselves a higher quality product, create a, an entire new industry for our city. We really don't have any farms here right now. So how do we, we can create thousands of jobs, lots of money, lots of tax revenue. So we'll get into all that. I'm going to point that way. Okay, so let's talk about some solutions. How do we build farms? We need to build our farms closer in, closer to our cities. And I know we, uh, 
a few of you were at the panel discussion this morning, and it's great. We have farmers from Arkansas River Valley. We have Denver. We have you know out out east. There's some you know a lot of cattle ranches, and those are great. But we need to figure out how do we get our farms integrated back into our cities. I mean, really, if you think about it, it's been a historical model for farming throughout time. You had a city where people lived, and you built farms to support that. It was a very symbiotic relationship that we have cheap fuel allowed us to sever and push farms away, but now we're seeing that that, that model may not be the best for us. We're going to actually begin to, to suffer underneath that, that model as fuel prices continue to go up. So we need to be able to bring our farms back in. Now that means not only in an urban setting where we can actually grow things, you know, we can grow a lot of produce here. We can grow in, in our urban cities. Obviously we can't have you know, a, a, a cattle farm or a hog farm but we can have chickens and goats and things like that. But we can grow a lot of produce. Where there's water, we can grow things. And we have that option. So bringing our, how, how, one way is to bring our, our farms in closer to our city. Is Katie here? Is she in here? <laughs> Building a direct-to-the-consumer distribution model. That's another way that we can help our small farms once they get back into the city. Cut out the middleman, cut out the wholesale side of things, deliver the products directly to the consumer through things like the public market, um, where, where we can have a, a very close relationship with these, these farms and, have, and, and deliver those products right to the consumer in a way that allows us to retain a lot of those, those profits, that allows the, the farmer to retain a lot of those profits. So. All right, next is going to be, you know, when we looked at the big picture of this, we, you know, we, Larry and I and a lot of other folks have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how in the world do we lower these costs? How do we, Katie, you were just, I'm going to back up. Yes. Oh, we skipped See? This is an intimate audience. We can do that. We can back up. We're going to do that tonight too, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So when we looked at the big picture of how do we do this, there was two big, two big equations, two big parts to this formula that we had to figure out. One is the cost of land. Land is not, it is not inexpensive, especially if we're going to stay in close to the city. The other was structures. Yeah, we, we looked at, there, is, there are thousands of acres of fallow farmland all around El Paso County. When we went out and actually looked at that land, a lot of it is in pretty sad shape. It just hasn't been used. It has the, the structures haven't been used. The, um, the farmhouses are in, in disrepair. So when we, we looked at that, we thought, gosh, we could spend a lot of money just taking the existing structures and bending those back into shape and trying to get them to a point where they are actually usable again. So we kind of took that out of the equation, along with land out of the equation, and then we came up, we started, obviously everybody knows about tiny homes, and, and it is just a, a great movement. I think this younger generation saw our generation, you know, buy the, buy the, tra you know, the, the, the track home and the middle class lifestyle and saw how much it sucked for us. And so they're like, mm, why? Why do that? You know, they, they love this tiny home movement. They love getting back to the land, and, and we, can, we can figure out, how, we need to figure out how we can help them do that. So, tiny homes, portable tiny homes are everywhere now. You see them all over the place. There are tons of amazing plans and, and, and uh, resources for us to tap into. They're also very inexpensive. I mean, you can build a tiny home like that size, <coughs> the one on the right, for ten to $15,000. And that's great. We can, you know, that allows us to put somebody on, in, in a home that isn't going to break, break the bank for them. They're not going to be having to go out and spend a bunch of money on, on building the, the structures. Affordable time. Land is the other one we talked about earlier. So how do we, there was, when we looked at that, we figured how do we do that? There are, again, like I said, thousands of acres of fallow land all around the county. So, and a lot of that is owned by farmers. It still has agricultural status on it. It still has agricultural water on it. We can go to those farmers and lease that land. It's one way we can press that, that land back into service. They don't, they're not looking for a lot of money to make on it. We can actually, it allows us to put these tiny farms on their land and put them back into service, which is easy for everybody. The farmer wins, our young farmer wins, we all win ultimately, so. I have a question. Yes, sir. Getting so serious. Is there a hyper requirement for teeny farmers? Teeny <laughs> farmers, yes. Yes, you can't be over 12. My daughter is the prototype. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and you, know, you know what's fascinating though, if you really actually, we, Larry and I have spent some time looking at these tiny homes and they are really, you know, it is not, it is not living, it, it's pretty nice. I mean, they have showers, they have bedrooms, they have kitchens, they have everything, all the sort of modern amenities. Well, we'll yeah. let them know it's not that one though. It's not that one, but that's a good example of one. <laughs> I mean, they're bigger, they're much bigger than yeah. the tiny homes we were looking at, like three times that size. Right. So when we took the land out of the equation, when we took the build, re, build, restoring the infra infrastructure out of the equation, that really allowed us to lower the overhead and, and the barriers to entry to these young farmers. So that's one part of the equation. Another one is they need help. So that's kind of where we come in. And not only us, not only Larry and I, but all of us come in, especially people who have knowledge here on this specifically, we need to figure out how to re-farm here. Really, what, what, there's sort of this strange perception that I run into a lot, which is people think there are farms over there, they're out there somewhere, and we have a local food system here, and it's, it's thriving and doing well, it is sort of one of the perceptions that we come across a lot. The other is, well, when we need farms, we'll just start a farm, <laughs> and we'll just... The food will just sort of show up like a magic cornucopia of food. We'll just fly by and drop it in, the, in, our, in our laps. So farming here is, is different than farming anywhere else. It's different from farming where in Kansas or it's different than farming in Boulder. So we have to be able to not only get started now, but figure out how we do that here and also doing it in new, in, in new ways that work here in our climate. For example, growing four season, growing in greenhouses, um, you know, building structures that are, are uh, designed for our climate and, and don't collapse under the first three foot snowstorm. Um, they need help obtaining land. They need help uh, building and attaining boarding houses. We kind of cover all this, anyway. We need help marketing their products. So that's another way we can actually we really need to get better at here. So one of the things we do with our farmers that do exist here is we, we say, okay, farmers, you're relegated to one of two things. You're either going to be in the wholesale model and you're going to dump your products to you know, whoever they, the, the highest bidder is. You're going to give back a bunch of profit, but you give back, they give back a bunch of your time. Either that or you're going to go into the, you're going to go into the uh, farmer's market model, which means you're going to take the chance that you can go to the farmer's market, spend a day or two or three or however many days you need to spend, and you're going to hopefully sell everything that you have and hopefully make enough money to get you through that week. Um, there, there are great hybrid models now that use the internet, that use uh, things like the public market, where we can allow <coughs> these farmers to, to have more time on the farm, push their products out through distribution, th um, through public markets and things like that, and allow them to um, allow them to retain a lot of those profits and retain their time. Am I talking too fast? Are you getting all this? Yeah. All right. Um, can you say something about? You may back up and Katie slide again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can back up. Yes. Um, can you say where we are with the conversation public market? Um, tomorrow is a big announcement. Okay. You hope. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's not here, I don't see him. But, yeah, I think it's still in, what would you say, Katie? Information. Information. <laughs> That's like information. Really, so, like information. For sure, brand new. <laughs> I'm just tight your phone. Sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dave already did that this morning. Come back tomorrow and there'll be a big announcement. Um, mm -hmm. And then lastly, we as a city, and we are, there are more of us showing up all the time, need to begin to think differently about our food and reestablish that small farm mentality and support these small farmers, support local farms here, and, and, and sacrifice to the degree that you know, we are willing to go to those farmers markets, go buy those products, support those local farmers. And I think more and more people are doing that just because they want to. Yes? Craig, is there a big issue with zoning at all? I drive across the city and I see different plots of land that are bigger than a, you know, yes. standard plot of, for, a, for a home to be set on. I grew up on a farm, so my brain automatically goes, wow, that'd be an amazing place. Yeah. But they're throughout the city, and you talked about instead of us pushing it farther out east, which definitely has happened, how do we incorporate that into a city 
if the zone has already been placed is what it should be. Can that ever be changed or altered? Sure, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. When you look at all, really pretty much all of the zoning regulations and water regulations that have been passed in the last 50 years were designed for one thing. They were designed to push the farms further out. So they made it less advantageous for the farmers to be there, made it more difficult, pushed those farmers out so that we could open up land here in our city that we could build homes on. And we made that choice. I, I, don't, I don't like to point out that there's any kind of one particular, you know, it's the boogeyman or it's the developers or it's the city council or we as a city made that choice to grow out into our farmlands. So we as a city can also make the same choice and say, okay, now it's time to, we, we've gone to the extreme, we need to pull back some and begin <laughs> to change zoning laws. Zoning laws are, the, the zoning department falls under the city council and, and, uh, and also the El Paso County um, Board of Commissioners, and we can go to them and petition and say, listen, we want to open up more farmland. We want to open up more agricultural availability for our small farms. So we got here, we can get back from here. Know if, if when we ever get back to having really bad water restrictions, how yes. does that impact a uh, farmer? Because technically, that's their livelihood. It is. And you see car washes and people are able to keep their car wash going, but yet we're on water restrictions. Yes. You know, we can, you know, shift things around and maybe have money go towards city farmers versus car washes. Right. Is I, that something? That I think happen? that's sort of a two prong question or answer here. One is we need to think differently about how we farm. You know, the days of, you know, hundreds of acres, open ditch irrigation, flood type irrigating, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for our water restrictions. I mean, you heard Dan Hobbs talking, if you were here earlier today, talking about the fact that water's a huge issue. You know, ditches are drying up. You know, we, we work with Venatucci Farm. They have a huge issue every year. When Nick Venatucci sold those water rights, he had ditch rights, and he thought, dang, I got water forever and ever. He forgot to, to he didn't realize that there's also a giant city being built upstream from him. So one of the things we can do is think differently about that. And that's where I say we have got to change our mentality of thinking big ag to a lot smaller, growing in greenhouses, growing in controlled environments, using drip irrigation so that we are not dumping tons of water out in the atmosphere. We're retaining that, we're using that water, and, and we're really being, being good stewards of that water. Experiencing pushback because ag zoning is so much cheaper in taxes than residential. Yes. I don't know how the city would want to give up that income. Well, yes, that, that's a huge problem. <laughs> We're going to have to get over that. We're going to have to work through that. But and, and you know it's interesting. There still is agricultural land in the city, and they, there's still agricultural land in the zoning. Actually, I'll show you a map. Um, we're going. It's coming up here, but um, you'll see that you know, we can still have agricultural zoning here. And, and I'm, you know, really, I think there can be a very symbiotic relationship with the right kind of farms in our cities, in our, inside our city limits, but there is also just outside our city limits or just outside of the, the city boundaries or borders, tons of land, a lot of land that we can actually tap into that's just sitting there fallow. And there's a lot of farmers that, that are very adamant about the fact that they do not want to see this land go to development. They want to see it pressed back into service. We also, there's a lot of land under conservation in this area as well. And we're working with Palmer Land Trust folks to try and figure out how we open up some of that land to this type of model. And the great thing about this type of model on that type of conserved land is it has a very light footprint. We're not building structures, we're not building barns, we're not doing you know, massive construction projects. We can come in with a very light footprint and set it on, on a, a piece of conserved land and not do, you know, do very little if any damage to the to the uh, actual environment. Any questions? So this is kind of a mock-up that we've done. It's it's um, kind of shows uh, the idea of what we're talking about. Small greenhouse. So the big picture on on our tiny farm project is there's sort of four parts to it. There's the tiny home. Everything's portable. So a tiny home, a 1,000 square foot, four season greenhouse. Um, uh, Portable outbuildings that are um, built out of shipping containers, uh, and we want to use those. There's there's thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of shipping containers just sitting all over, all over Denver that are just they'll just damn near give them to you, because it's just cheaper to uh, it's it's 
cheaper to get rid of them or cut them up than it is to send them back to where they came from. So we can use shipping containers <coughs> and, and build purpose-built outbuildings in those. So whether you want to do you know, hog farrowing, whether you want to do you know, livestock enclosures, whether we want to do built milking parlors, well, we can build all of these things beforehand and then drop them in place so that we, um, we have a, a, a pre-built, ready-to-go drop it in place instead of spending much time trying to bend structures back in place. So, and then lastly would be a mobile chicken coop. So a, a mobile chicken coop that holds up to 200 chickens, everything's mobile, portable, can be moved around. So that's kind of the big picture of what this tiny farm is. How many chickens did you want? 200. 200? So you would do 200 on a tiny farm? Or? On the right size tiny farm. So yeah, you know, you need about three to five acres to really make that work well. On a, in town, obviously, there are limitations. And, and if we're doing urban, mm -hmm. we're, we, we will retool to still using the tiny home, still using the, the greenhouse, because that's really, uh, you know, fits pretty well in most mm -hmm. areas. So hang on one second. Mm -hmm. Yes? The right size for oh land wise, yeah we can go we can go anywhere from a half an acre all the way up to forty acres. So as obviously we get you know if, if you're doing a lot of ruminants if you're doing dairy cows if you're doing dairy goats you're gonna need a little more real estate so you can actually. Um, I'm just thinking with the two hundred chickens. Oh, two hundred chickens? Yeah, I mean they, they you probably want to be about two to three acres so that you can move them around effectively so they're not destroying the land and being too rough on things. Any other questions? Yeah. When you were talking shipping containers, are you talking the wooden ones or were you nope. talking the metal? metal? Yeah, they're a little bit more uh, hardy. We'll see some pictures next time. Who are you looking at to build those structures out of the shipping containers? You know what, there's actually, um, a lot of that can be built right here. I mean, CC students and, and people who are interested in doing that kind of engineering, it's, it's really not that hard. They're, they're pretty easy. It's a kind of a blank slate, so and we don't have to. It's not like we're going to live in them per se. So we're just building. You know, the animals don't. You can live in them too. Yeah, you can live in them too. We have one cool. at uh, our community center, mm -hmm. and it's we have it as a bike library, and it is a blank slate. We just fill it with what you need. Yeah, I mean they come in pretty handy. So, so part of this is what I want to talk about today. Also, is we need more than just farmers. We need more than just people who want to play in the dirt. So we need people that are going to be able to to help, in, like you said, just, just there. Sustainable construction. There, there is a whole movement afoot right now to build these new generation of tiny homes that are sustainable using solar, using composting toilets, gray water reclamation. Uh, you know, there, there's just on and on all the things that we can do with these. But, but it's gonna take people to come, that are willing to come in and help us engineer these for our climate, for our environment, so that they can withstand the, the, the uh, elements here and not uh, get destroyed. So, um, and, and it could be it could be shipping container buildings, it could be portable buildings, it could be fixed buildings that we drop in place. I mean, there's really kind of a, a whole slew of, of this sort of tiny home thinking and tiny home designs that, that we can press into the in service. Um, New mobile farming structures. This is this is sort of an area as well. There's a lot of great models. Joel Salatin is probably one of the best examples. He's a farmer out of Virginia, and has done amazing things. But he's on 500 acres, and so we need to we need people to help us figure out how to downsize this. And I've done a lot of this. We did a lot of this on our farm, building mobile chicken coops that are smaller, easier to move around, easier for a, you know one or two people to transport and and set back up. Um, you know, the shipping container buildings, all that as well. We're going to need people to help us engineer those new structures that allow us to be mobile as well. High tunnels and, and greenhouses. This is an area that is, you know, you can buy a lot of stuff off the shelf. A lot of stuff off the shelf doesn't work for us here. I just was talking with a farmer who's out east, built a greenhouse almost exactly like that. The wind came up and blew the whole damn thing down. I mean, destroyed it flat. So, yeah, he, he bought the off-the-shelf model, and, and it just was not built. It was not designed to sustain in our environment. We see a lot of these as well. You know, one big snowstorm, and they kind of go, whoop, and they, 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 they crunch. So we, we need people who can help us design these, make these better um, on the engineering side. Um, so here are some, ship, some examples of shipping, uses of shipping containers. You see one there is is obviously being used as a barn. I've seen these used for chicken coops. I've seen them used for rabbits. 
I've seen them used for all kinds of livestock, and it's, it's really a neat way to, to uh, create a structure that is very, very easy to move around. You, know, you can, I mean, easier than a barn to move around. And then you can see there's another example. I actually know a guy who's building one of these out of two shipping containers, a barn, and using the structures, using the storage area and then as a garage. And then also there's shipping container home. So we have a lot of options and a lot of neat things we can do with these shipping containers. Any questions? And if you're going to live in something, are there permitting hurdles? There are permitting Building hurdles. <coughs> yes. So the portable, the portable um, tiny homes that we're talking about fall under the RV side of the code. Uh -huh. So there's sort of the, the home side of the code. There, there's really the, the house side of the code, the mobile home side of the building code, and then the RV side of the building code. The RV side of the building code gives you a lot more latitude. Um, I, I think we are going to and come... Is that defined by being mobile? Is that what yes, because it's built on a chassis and it can be moved easily and it, it can be towed easily. So that, that I, think, I think we are going to run into issues probably in the not too distant future where folks are going to want to... Folks in the zoning side of the city will be trying to figure out how does how do these fit into our zoning laws. But right now there is a lot of latitude in terms of using it on the RV side. Yes. I wanted to add to that the, the other problem is, is that yeah they're qualified as RVs, but then you're only allowed to live in it for like thirty days. You're not allowed to live in it full time. At least that's what it is right now. It depends on where you're at. In the city or the county, yeah, there are different restrictions. And the nice thing is we can set them up, like for example, we were working with Darren Zaruba from Eco Cabins. He can actually take the exact same model and set it up for either a home, a mobile home, or an RV. And really it's just about how you choose, and there's some, some overall code restrictions in terms of fire and egress and all that, but most of them apply across the board. So if we're in an urban area that does have those requirements where you can't live in an RV, you can simply attach it and call it a, a, a home as well. So, they, you know, it's, it's sort of that difference between a mobile home and an RV gets pretty blurry pretty quick. So. Any other questions? All right. Water rights. Water is, is uh, and everybody knows, it's, I, I like to call it, yeah, that's, a, that's my favorite water rights picture. I, I, it's sort of the dark arts of, of, law, of law here in, in, you know, for all you Harry Potter fans. Yeah, it, it is special magic you have to know in order to understand water law. So we're going to run into that. And we need people who can help us, who are willing to dive into and find areas where we can, we can work and we can navigate inside those water restrictions. Obviously, if we're in the city, city water gives us the ability to do a lot, have a lot more latitude. If we're in the, if we're in the uh, out in the county or areas where there are well, well water, we have to work within the, the confines of water restrictions and laws. Again, though, there is lots of ag land out there. I've looked, I, I have been on it, I've stood on it, I have pulled the well permits for every one of those farms that I've looked at, and they have water rights, they're sitting on them, they don't want to sell them, they don't want to give them up, they want to see them run with the land, but they want to see the land pressed back into use. So, water is going to be a, a, a ongoing fight that we're going to have to get good at so that we can restore these farms because there are going to be, there are formidable foes that will, will fight against us on this topic. One starts with an N. Hmm? One starts with an N. Yes. <laughs> Small farm advocates. This is another area where we really need people, especially young folks who are willing to jump in and, and fight both at the legislative level, at the state, our county and our local level. Um, Jill Gabler is, is obviously probably my favorite champion for fighting this, a lot of these re re um, regulations. The goats, you know, she, I know she loves being called the goat, the goat lady. <laughs> but she, she, you know, it answered a question that you asked earlier. Somebody stepped up and said, why can't we do this? Why, you know, why, why shouldn't we be able to have goats? in town. I mean, what's the difference? I'll take a barking goat over a barking dog any day. So I think, you know, we have the ability, we just have to have the desire, but we are going to need people who are going to be to, to advocate for these small farms and, and fight for us at the governmental level to help us restore, uh, restore um, our, our local farms. So here's a zoning map. 
just to give you, if you, if you want to make your head spin around, the, um, let's see, it's, it's the dark brown one. The dark brown areas, which you see mostly around the outside, are mostly all zoned for ag. But as you can see, though, still, there is some zoning still in town that, that ha maintains those agricultural statuses. So we ha that's a lot of land. We can do a lot on that. We don't necessarily, we don't need to have the whole city zoned for ag, but there are areas where we, we can change the zoning and should change the zoning or take advantage of zoning that already hasn't changed. Um, so. so looking at that, uh -huh. what, so, in addition to the dark brown, mm -hmm. what color would you look at to say is the, the next highest potential? Well, a lot of that is the open spaces, a lot of the recreational areas, the green areas, the areas, um, yeah, kind of that, that lighter green, those are areas that are owned by the city and county that uh, we can use. I know Harry is goes a Colorado College student here. We, we went to visit his um, greenhouse that he's building yesterday. And CC has opened up a park, right? Across the street there for you? Or is yeah, it? that's just where we're building it. We're going to move one, two behind the inn, one, two the CC farm, and then one, two the eggplant manor. So, where we live. so yeah, there, there, there are lands that are owned both privately and publicly. And zoning can be changed. You can actually go to the county, to the zoning board, and it's a $2,500 application you submit to the county, and they will, you have to ask your neighbor's permission and get their blessing, but you can absolutely. I'm, I'm working with a farm out in Black Forest. They changed their zoning. They actually did it through a variance and ran the gauntlet through the county commission and got the variance to switch the land from rural residential five to ag 35, which was huge that they were able to do that. It, it's still, now their neighbors are all upset at them and are suing them because you know, everybody wants local food as long as it's not in their backyard. So, um, land acquisition. This is another area that we have to figure out as well. Palmer Land Trust has been very great, very helpful with us. They're helping, they want to get engaged in the process. They want to figure out how to press some of this um, existing conserved land because some of them have the ability to farm on them or have the ability to do things other than just straight conservation. Um, and then also here in town and out of town, changing those zoning rights, changing that, that um, back to agricultural. All right, like I said earlier, this is a project for all of us. It's just for, just for the people who want to play in the dirt. So. I think. Now I'm going to plug my Indiegogo campaign. For those of you who don't know about it, you saw the video. We are trying to raise the money. We need $30,000 to build the first prototype. And once we have that done, we already have land identified that we can put, put it on. And I think once we do that, we'll be able to show people really what we're able to do. We have farmers already identified. We have land identified. We simply need to build the first one, and that's where we're hoping to get the word out and uh, get things, get this thing up and running, so we can show what we're doing here. So, um, oh, I forgot to say, one percent of the population donated ten dollars. Five thousand people donated ten dollars. We could build our first prototype. So, you want to add any of this? Um, just that I think you're further along than you think. I know, I'm moving. I'm, ro I'm rocking and rolling. Um, you know, just, just to put some concrete uh, stuff into this here, um, there, we have two plots of land, you know, that Craig is looking at. I, I'm kind of a son.